Welcome everybody. It is April 26. We just calculated the number of number of meeting this is, or this is number 64, if our count is correct. Uh, so congrats everybody. Leap 4.0 just released. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Brian and talk about the, the Leap status and uh, get into the agenda for the day. Yes, what, what viewers who are watching this after the fact missed was that there was a whole cons consensus protocol involved in calculating that figure. So, um, yeah, so I, I do have a couple of announcements on um, release things uh, in the Antelope world. So first of all, um, Antelope Leap V4.0.0, um, you know, is officially released as of yesterday. And uh, some node operators are, are already upgrading to that. Um, so uh, please, you know, if you if you want to help sort of spread the word, uh, go out to the social channels and uh, retweet those, uh, you know, give your comments on it, that sort of thing, just so that we can get the word out there. Uh, but yes, and I, I want to, you know, thank all the core developers who have been involved in that. <clears throat> A lot of really good work went into that, and also everybody who's been actively engaged in this call. Uh, it's been a, a very important source of feedback, and so we appreciate that. And continuing on that theme, um, I have another announcement before we do this, but continuing on that theme, we do have a, um, uh, a proposal we want to review uh, with folks on this call today. Uh, after this next announcement, which is that um, the CDT um, version 4.0.0 release candidate one will hopefully be released before close of week. Um, I'm sorry, uh, update to that. Uh, my, my notes contain both of these statements. So uh, you're getting it live. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the CDT is actually targeted for uh, early next week. That's the release candidate one of version four CDT. Uh, that's that's it on the announcements. Um, and with that, the the thing that we wanted to sort of review today, um, we we brought Greg on, um, who has written a proposal. We haven't we haven't posted this proposal publicly yet. We'll be doing that shortly after um, after this discussion for when we're seeking basically initial feedback on. Um, I suppose I'll. It might be most effective to just let Greg take it from the top and introduce it. I'm good. If I may, if I may right quick, um, for, I think this is the first time Greg's been on the call. So Greg's a, a core developer, uh, ENF, um, or one of our new rock stars, um, doing excellent work over here. He's somewhat new to the ecosystem, but he's uh, dove right in, and we've had uh, we've had a great time actually working together and, and discussing his proposal. So with that, I'll hand it over. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm going to try my best. No, don't hesitate to jump in, Kevin, if, I, if you want to say anything. Um, so basically what we've done is uh, Kevin started it, and I, I've worked on it as well. We, we have moved. We used, we used to basically process API requests, such as get block, completely on, on a single thread, on the main thread of the application. So long requests were a big issue because uh, they basically would freeze the application for every other process, any other processing. Uh, so we we had very strict uh, time requirements in place to avoid freezing the main straight the main thread for too long. So what we've done now is we've moved a big part of the processing, the main part of the processing, off the main thread onto the HTTP thread pool, which is a mo where we can run multiple threads. So so now the the time requirements we had that sometimes would cause requests to fail, such as get block, you know, would fail because of a timeout for some blocks that were especially big or required, or had lots of actions requiring a uh, timely ser deserialization. So now that we've moved that to the HTTP thread pool, we, we thought of a better way to basically specify the time delays that API requests uh, are constrained with. And we, for some for some requests such as get block for example if you run an api node you basically want your get block request to actually go through right because if it fails because it's a very large block that has lots of actions 
there's not much thing a user can do except retrying it and it's going to fail again because it still has a lot of actions. So, so we wanted this to, to not be constrained by the HTTP uh, max request time. I forgot, the, I forgot the name, max response time. And um, we, so now what we're going to do is we, uh, we are going to, for such requests such as, such as get block or send transactions, which, which are bounded, it's, uh, and most of the processing is done on the HTTP thread pool anyways, we're not going to enforce any delay except for the serialization of some special ABIs because we want to guard against a specially crafted ABI that would basically explode the time take, taken to deserialize something. So, so we, so what we're going to do is like a get block would actually run as long as it takes, but every single ABI deserialization would be bounded by the max deserialization time. And if it fails, we're just going to still return the results, but in a non deserialized form, in a binary form. So the, so basically if, 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 a, if there is a block that has some, some ABIs that be especially crafted to try to trick the node into taking a very too much time. Those won't be deserialized, but we will still return a valid block where everything that can be deserialized in in a reasonable time will be deserialized. So in that way, it will work like get through block if it goes over the the max uh, deserialization time. Yeah. So get of course get through block would also be the same. So 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 now now there is there would be less need for get through block except if. If you do it, if you did want to just get a roadblock without anything deserialized, you can still use that, 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 that API, but now there won't be, I think get roadblock was basically introduced because some deserialization was taking so long that sometimes, uh, it, you, you would not be able to do it within the max response time. But now that with that new proposal, you, you could actually just always use get block and there won't, shouldn't be any problem with it. It will always return a block. And um, some, especially long ABIs, will not be deserialized. But in, in some cases, which were really intended to basically hurt us, right? It's not like a valid use case where in in any regular any regular ABI would be deserialized within the the time limit, the ABI, the ABI uh, did, um, ABI serializer max time milliseconds. So thank you. That, that, that's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if I might right quick, actually, there, there's another reason we provided the get while block, which is the fact that when we deserialize a get block call, we use current ABIs on chain. And if that's a old block and not a current block, or even for a current block, the ABIs that's being used to deserialize that block are not necessarily the ABIs that were in play when that block was created. And so there is potential problems with deserializing a block and using those those old ABIs. That particular issue has not been fixed. We still just use the the current ABI. So if you want to do uh ABI deserialization, you know, correctly in all cases, uh then you can do the give raw block, uh cache the ABIs yourself and use the correct ABIs that uh that are appropriate for the action within that block. Okay, and, and so so the, the last part of the proposal is that we still have this HTTP max response time that is now used for some request that can request a variable number of items, like for example, get table rows. So if you run a node, you can still decide that the maximum time you want to spend on the main thread for a specific API that requests a variable number of items is so many milliseconds. And what's going to happen is that we're going to retrieve as many ISTEM as we can within that max response time on the main thread. And then we're going to post that to be deserialized on the HTTP thread pool. And they will all, all the ones that were retrieved will be deserialized. So, and that, that way the user will, can actually request, if, if they request a really large number, they will still get something and they will, they will be able to request more if they want. So, so that's basically the, the meat of the proposal. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any question or. Yeah. So a couple other things there might add, um, we're also proposing a hard coding 1000 limit on get table rows. Um, uh, because of the fact that 
uh, you know, a lot of people might have max response time set high already, or or they might, you know, it's possible if even at at something as small as you know, or let's say thirty milliseconds or something. It, it, that could be a rather large number of rows, like that might be 10,000 or 100,000 rows of table data that you would then need to deserialize, which could take, you know, who knows, depending on how the, the ABIs are for, for those particular, could take a considerable amount of time. And so we, we thought it best to maybe just limit that to, to 1,000, um, knowing that, of course, that, you know, people can make um, multiple calls there. Now, we did say even, and so we can discuss that 1,000, higher, lower, and maybe not there at all. That's something you certainly look for feedback on. The other thing in response to that, if you're running a local node, you can actually set HTTP max response time to negative one, and then you could make a call to say, just give me all the rows. And I'd say there's, you know, a million rows, and it would just take, you know, an hour to do or something. Well, if you would just sit there and let you, you know, let you do that on, on your local node. Uh, but then it won't guarantee, sorry, uh, if it does that, like get table rows on, say, like all the tables, and you have over 100,000, and uh, what not? Are you guaranteed that those uh, all these rules, even if it takes an hour, are actually all coming from the same kind of snapshot state at that point yeah. in time? Yeah. Okay. Yes, which would be you know one reason why you might want to run a local node just to make that simpler. Uh, otherwise, you know if you're if you're if you don't have that setting or you're hitting a public node, you know you're not quite sure you know between the gaps whether something has changed. For example, you know block has come in and changed the state. So. Um, yeah, so that yeah, currently the only way I think is just through either a history solution, like in yeah. the diffuse and at certain blocks you can get, you can specify the block number at, to retrieve the state you want, or like the old school way, I guess, is you load, you know, a snapshot and you just set it not to peer and you keep like, you know, retrieving uh, the data, say, uh, from it. I was wondering if there's any plan, this might be kind of like uh, on the side. But Diffuse used to have a tool as part of the Diffuse binary that allows you to, um, it was part of their bootstrapping a chain, but they had this thing called Migrate. And what it does is it just takes a simple snapshot file and it kind of deconstructs it into like a folder hierarchy for every single, you know, like uh, a contract or, or account and whether it had a DBI and all the different tables it had. Uh, but that got broken or at least like, you know, Diffuse is not maintained. So that doesn't work anymore after I think version 2.0.6 or something to that effect. Are there any plans to do something like that? Because I think that's super useful. We, we have something and we, you know, we welcome feedback on it. It's already available. You can try it out, but you can convert a, a snapshot to JSON and that will expand out the, the snapshot in JSON form and you can open that up and, and look at it and, and do whatever you want to or potentially even break that down into the smaller pieces. It is one gigantic JSON file as it currently currently is is implemented, but there are plenty of editors that are able to open it and work with you know large files like that. Um, yeah, just programmatically, naturally, you'd want to you know handle that programmatically. Uh, no, that's perfect. Can I have the name of that tool? Uh, it, it's available. I think it's in uh, three two. Uh, actually, does anybody know off the top of their head? It's just the it's the leap util um, and snapshot. Okay, leap util. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and you already think I think in, in 3 1, I think it was part of Nodia. Um, I have to look exactly when it's added, but it should be in whatever uh, version you're using, I, I believe, because everyone hopefully is on at least 3 2 at this point. So you, you should be available to you. Thank you. All right. Any any other questions on this proposal or or concerns? Um, just a, just a quick one. Um, you said it's a different thread, right? So is, is that like offload some of the weight off the main Nodius thread? Yeah, most most of the processing will be done in the HPP thread pool, um, which would be one reason, like in 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 five O, to increase that. Even in four O. Like you probably would it would want to consider increasing that thread pool size because even in four old we moved a number of things off of the main thread into that thread pool. So that thread pool is getting a lot more use in four dot old than it did in in any three X version. So oh, uh, good. you should see, see benefit in increasing that thread pool size. The default I believe is two. Uh, I believe all of our thread pools defaults are, are size two. Um, 
but yeah, you may want to consider increasing that, particularly on, on a public API node. Uh, you may see some, some benefit there. Nice. Thanks. And does that, and does the parallelization uh, that occurs on like read only, uh, or like get calls, for example, does that take an effect if you're making, say one of those big calls under the new proposal for get table rows, or it's more like it can just handle like each request might go to a different thread and scale that way. But one call would never kind of go on multiple thread, even if it's a big call. That is, correct. that is correct. So I, I believe what you're referring to in 4.0, we have the new read only thread pool uh, that you can specify. And then you can specify a read window or write window, right? And so during the, the read window portion of that, it, it will use the number of threads that you specified in the, in the read only thread pool. And, and so when you're in the right window, you have one main thread that's doing everything, including like get table row call, right? And then when you enter the, the read window, it spans out, if you will, into a number of, into the number of threads that specified in the read only thread pool. And during that, that time window, uh, calls like get table rows will be, you know, allocated across those threads and, and run. Uh, they're not like moved during the processing, but you can process two or more, uh, depending on how many of those you have configured, get table row calls in parallel during that read window. Uh, although, yeah, but that happens on multiple calls, but not on like one call will never use multiple threads. That is correct, Colonel. Uh, that's the, the way that it's uh, in the report at all. So it's going to be, so it's going to be interesting the, um, that now we have basically two separate processing. We have the, the processing of the API itself, like the, the, like the processing of the transaction or, or, or the retrieval, like if you run get table rows, we retrieve the binary data and that could actually be again, split into multiple threads, like Kevin was just saying. And then once we have retrieved the, the data or process the transaction. Then we need to return the result to the user, including the deserialization, you know, the into JSON. And so that's that again, that second party is farmed to the HTTP thread pool to be to be done on separate threads. And again, each request would be on one thread. So if you if you are running a get block that has lots of actions, you know, and there's a lot of it takes a lot of time to create the response, you know, the JSON response, then that would occur on one thread. So if you if you have a HTTP thread pool with eight threads, only one thread would be busy with that request. And you see have seven other threads being able to serve, serve other API requests. And one thing you may want to do besides increasing the size of your HTTP thread pool is maybe reduce the HTTP max response time because now uh, the request will, be, will spend much less time than before uh, on the main thread, and that's the HTTP max response time would be only limiting that part. So, so before, if you if you had a, a max response time that allowed you to serve a table of one thousand rows, and you leave it the same, then that same time would now potentially be able to serve a request of much much more than that, except that we've limited it to now one thousand. But but so so you. Uh, for serving the same the same size of request, you you probably will have to reduce your max HTTP max response time significantly. And before there was this issue that, uh, because of some specific requests like get block that could be very could take a really really long time, node operators would be were tempted to set a really really large HTTP max response time to make sure that any block went through. So now that that's not be needed anymore to be cautious like that. You can actually because get block will not be subject to the HP max response time. So so you you can actually set the actual max response time you reasonably want for any request to to be something like I don't know ten milliseconds or something like that. And again, that's for the proposal we're talking about here. And for that all, you will need to continue to set that large to get the the behavior that you want for the for the get block, which is well. I think we discussed that. But the end result, sorry, but the end result there, like say you're doing a thousand request calls or your your old max response allowed a thousand request calls uh, to get table rows, for example, uh, a thousand like uh, rows, sorry, for get table uh, rows. Then even in the new paradigm, even though those same milliseconds now can get you much more, uh, due to that hard-coded 1,000, you're still limited by that. Yeah, so. And that's not a big question, I'll, I guess. Yes, so, and that's, we're seeking feedback, right? That's the whole purpose here is the, the 1,000 uh, 
with stairs is kind of almost a safeguard of like we know people have that setting high and so if we limit it to a thousand you know that should that should keep people from like you know shooting themselves in the foot but i mean we could remove that thousand if, if that sounds um uh restrictive or we could increase it to something larger um welcome to feedback there for sure personally i think like having it like a thousand by default is a consig and then allowing an API, especially like a local API node, you know, like that might not be exposed to to the public to handle whatever else, you know, whatever the admin or the administrator of it wants to provide. Uh, okay, so that is in the proposal, Elisa. So let, let, let's know if this satisfies that request. So currently in the proposal is if you set HTTP max response time to negative one, then it ignores that a thousand and you can basically hit it for as many as you want and then it will honor what's in in the request right when you make the to get row um take get table rows uh request the, the your the the hpp request has within it two limits a time limit and a uh and a number of row limits if you set you know number of rows to say max int and time to you know whatever some gigantic value or, or max time then um then it would then it would basically take as long as it takes to return all that data Okay, the handle that is the use case I was like concerned about. That's, that's great to know. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So just some questions, um, you know, for the for the sake of stimulating conversation here and, and fully exploring this and getting feedback. Is it so is it in the case where the serialization takes too long, right? Um would it would it potentially return partially deserialized objects? Is that how it would work, or would it? No, so it would just. What exactly happens in that situation? So, so, so for every specific um, action, for example, that you want to be deserialized, um, if we we try to deserialize one action to, to and and it takes it takes longer than ABI. Max max uh, ABI serializer so max time MS. Then what we do is we return the the action in binary form, only for that action. So you may have a block with one thousand action, and maybe one of them was especially crafted to trick us into spending a an inordinate amount of time. So that one will not be deserialized. All the other one would be deserialized correctly. So you would have a, one action returned in binary, and all the others returned in correct deserialized form. So is there any, I guess the question I'd have for node operators and API sort of hosters is, uh, are there any concerns around the, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, the non-determinism of what might actually get returned um, with regards to? Well, it, it's, so I think, I think we already had that behavior before, like we already would, would basically bail out if any, if any action, and we may be more tolerant than before in the sense that before we might when any action was taking longer than ABI serializer max time MS, we would just abort the API request and and fail it. So now, so 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 now we're behaving. So we're now we're just trying to say, if, if there's an ABI that that cannot be deserialized, we won't deserialize it, but we will not fail the request. So like if you if you run a get block request, you will always get a result. And same yeah. o- another thing also is before we. If you if you do get table rows, same thing. You will always get a result, uh, yep. a bi- which before sometimes it would fail and you would get nothing. So here you would get that regardless of the time, you would always get at least one row, mm-hmm. and you get as many as you can within the specified HTTP max response time. And same thing for get table rows. The e- everything that can be deserialized will be deserialized. If one ABI deserialization fails, it will be returned in binary form. And we, and we can't even really relax that on a local node because I, I just Googled zip bomb. It's the same sort of issue. And I'm, and I'm, I, I, I can't be certain on this, but I, I think it's the case that we actually have some of these on chain and, and over ELF. So like if you were trying to get blocked from Genesis all the way up, you'd actually hit one of these, um, ABI bombs, if, if, if you will, where it, it, if you were to give it infinite amount of time, it would be happy to take that infinite amount of time to try to deserialize that, that ABI or at least close enough to infinite that it doesn't make any difference, right? I mean, measured in months or years to, to, to deserialize uh, some of these. Uh, if you're clever enough to uh, create an ABI that, that is malicious, if you will, like that, there um, is um, 
Yeah. So you have to guard against that no matter what. And so we're, we're doing that with uh, Greg talking about the ABI max serialization time. And so, uh, 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 currently in 4.0 and, and 3 and 2, that ABI uh, serialization time was more was more of a hard limit over the whole thing. That would, um, uh, even though it was kind of applied individually, once it was hit, often it would just draw an exception and you'd be done. And, that, and so you were required to kind of like keep uh, making that larger and then you'd either get like a whole block deseril de undeserialized or, or, or not. So in the proposal here, we're talking about applying that individually for each action. And so that that setting that you set, you may want to just uh, in in five and when this comes out, uh, you may want to also consider setting that lower. I think a lot of people have that at two thousand or three thousand, um, which is probably still fine unless somebody would actually uh, take the time to craft an ABA bomb for say every action within a block for say a thousand transactions. Then you know it would be a thousand times that that setting. So if you have that setting at two seconds, it'd be you know two seconds times a thousand. Would uh, for it, so it was a thousand transactions in that block, and so you might actually consider setting that one lower as well. Although the the chance of someone actually creating a one like that, I think is is. Is there a way? It's like I, I I kind of agree with like the issue Brian a bit raised about this, you know, indeterministic uh, stuff because generally you're not going on Tios and doing get block. You're you know you're doing it as part of some code. And then you, you're going to have to handle these weird exceptions and there's no kind of built-in way. Is there a way where you can, as part of that, like get block, you can say like, you know, something where if a certain, you know, contract or a certain ABI is taking too long, can you request that ABI as well as part of the return? So you can continue deserializing it, for example, locally. So you always have a path to keep continuing versus not knowing kind of really the state you're in and how you're going to manage it. Uh, yeah, we could potentially do something like that. But again, like if, if you were to do that local, you get that ABI and you try to deserialize it, like some of these can be drafted to take effectively infinite amount of time, right? You know, so you're trying to do it local, you can just pause as well. Like you would sit there for years trying to deserialize this one row in, in, in a table or a one action data. You, yeah, I guess the counter argument would be that you can, you know, once you, it's in your own code, you can set your own time limits, right? And just abort a call. So, sure. and then like, you know, ban that contract from Invic or, or whatever else like you might do. But in reality, like, I don't think there's really use cases that will, you know, require that. There might be better solutions for that kind of stuff as history solutions implement. Yeah, I would I would think anything along those lines that we might talk about doing, which, you know, we certainly could talk about doing, uh, you know, should also include the, the fix in terms of like being currently to get block deserialization uses the current ABI on chain, which is not necessarily the ABI that's that's associated with a given action at the time of the execution of that action. So that issue, you know, if we provided some sort of thing like that, we I think we want to address that as well. So I think this is an interesting. It, it in some ways relates to um, Matthew Darwin in in the chat brought up a bigger picture question, which is. He said, do we really need a git block API call that somewhat works, or should we just leave this to history solutions? Uh, is it history solution, the ones that use get block? <laughs> so that's a good question. Like, who uses git block and for what? I don't know. Somebody uses the hell out of it on our API, I can tell you that. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, I don't I don't mean to speak for Aaron who who can't be here for time zone reasons or whatnot, but I think he said that their solution is using Git block like under the hood. Does anybody can anybody check me on that? I believe they use uh, no the uh, as far as I know they're like you're talking about their robo or like the, their internal history solution. It uses actually um, uh, the trace API. And then they add additional decoration, like or information to it that is not usually provided by Trace API, uh, and then they provide that as part of their, you know, like front facing uh, API. But I think the main reliance is only Trace API, as far as I remember. Yeah, I think that's right. I think they've have a, a, a long um, idea of actually providing a PR that adds adds the additional stuff that they've added to the Trace API. But I don't think they've ever gotten around to actually creating a request. So yeah, I think it's their own. Act up version of trade API. 
Yeah, Matt. Yeah, as far as I know, they needed to add additional things because they never really incorporated the new action return value in their stuff. So, you know, you'd have to calculate the action digest differently, the action receipt digest, and all that stuff is going to differ. So I think they were planning to do that work before potentially like creating that merge or, or proposal. So Matthew in chat also added that, yeah, we would probably still need Git raw block, but not necessarily Git block for if, if we left this to history solutions. I, I think it definitely in the realm of, of a history solution to do it correctly, right? Because, because again, you know, we're not necessarily using the correct ABIs uh, and deserializing that block. And so to do it correctly, you need some sort of, of history type solution because a Nodius as it is today doesn't have the data it needs to actually do that correctly. Uh, we use git block info on heads up. We use it so that we can uh, work out uh, what was the last block that a BP produced, our BP that we are monitoring, and it'll you know give the block it was. But that's I actually I was thinking about it. It might need to go into the version five wish list some way to easily see this producer what was the last block block it produced. Gun block yeah. info doesn't use ABI uh, like it's, it's just really the header or like even a smaller version of the header. Yeah, yeah, but that is uh, extension. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. But that's we were just saying get blocks. So I say we use get block info quite a lot. So could you re repeat that wish list item for me so I can jot it down? What, what was it? An easy mechanism to see what the last block a block producer or a block producer count produced. And, you know, and then from that, I suppose we could derive, um, you know, when it was done, but, you know, any kind of information, like if I, if I did, you know, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. whatever it is, I mean, we all, we all do like, it isn't just a quick little API. It's always like a little bit of skunk works. Okay. We're going to monitor these mini blocks, see when we last produced, check those blocks, you know? I don't mean, if it was something, just the, something along the lines of like get, get block producer schedule, whatever that call is. Return. Yeah, something, something like that. Yeah, but then it will say that if this was the last block and this was the time. You know, right. So you want to know whether they run, you know, eleven block instead of twelve, for example. Or well, that's the next. That's the next step. But how about you get voted out of schedule, um, and you don't know or whatever it is. You just want to know when the last time you produced or your your BP went down. Oh, when was right. the most block I produced? You know, so like you can just expand get producer JSON to include, for example, like an additional like field which is tells you like last block produced. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that's the best way, but that's like one way. Right, but that if you find, that's the type of information you're you're seeking. How we yeah yeah yeah. But you're looking and, for and, for a, a given number of of maybe the top thirty block producers, let's say when they last produced how many and how many block they produced during that round well yeah yeah it, it'll be i mean understand where i'm coming from i'm coming from a purely real-time monitoring i want to know um what has like if if my node is going down when was the last block that i produced right now um our heads up platform is uh building a little uh history database of, you know, when it's produced and, and it's not querying the, I, I'm trying to get away from scraping a block log. I want to be able to just build that information straight from an API node. You know what I mean? So, um, so, so maybe, um, is the Prometheus something you might look at there if it included that information? Absolutely. But there needs to be Prometheus on the back of, uh, like a, a normal API node that supports it, not. I don't want to rely on an, something else. I don't want to rely on a history solution to know that if I produce a block, I'll, I mean, this is like base bone stuff. It's like foundational stuff. I just want to know, like, has it produced? How can I check what the last block I produced? I know that I am in the schedule because that's easy to see, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but, but didn't I produce? Why? What is the last block I produced? I just, that's kind of nice. And I think that'll help a lot of our monitoring solutions. And the only reason why it's like top of mind is because you were speaking about get block and I said, oh yeah, well, we use get block info because it's a little bit lighter 
and um and i and i know that we use that specifically to check when the last block we produced was okay so yeah i mean you know currently that type of information is not stored and that's not of course a large storage requirement to to add that to to a node if we were to add something like that it trains the end tracking of that a sufficient in terms of like uh as long as the node has been running long enough to, to yeah absolutely that equation uh then, yeah. then we could turn it otherwise the node might just not know like if you shut it down and restart it it wouldn't necessarily know without like jumping through a whole lot of hoops absolutely something lightweight super easy that just happens to be available everywhere you know? sure. yeah I, and even if it and even if it's just you know a short term you know something like that yeah I don't know. back into that information while the node is running yeah okay yeah sorry i didn't mean to sidetrack where we were going there but we just said I'm using that, get block. I'm using get block. <laughs> I mean, that's the reason for these calls, so that you can help those things to Brian, who's scribbling it all down. So, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Then we could. Come in, come in, come in, I could have fun of doing it. Yeah, coming back to the current proposal, uh, one one other piece, like question for node operators is um, whether uh, folks are running into these issues currently related on. Like in in the real world, right? Related to ABI deserialization time causing timeouts on on these requests. I mean, I've, I've seen. Do we have logs that would tell us this? Okay. In my yeah, the, the, the EOS the EOS Nation validator it tells us <laughs> the serialization is sick to look. Yeah, you get those heavy blocks, they don't work. That's true. That's probably the most consistent, to be honest with you. But yeah, yeah. I mean, you decipher it in in the complaints about your API being broken when. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in well, general, don't run it out of potato. I can tell you, potatoes it causes all sorts of problems. Yeah, now without running like HTTP in debug mode, um, you know, in 4.0, you could run it in debug mode and actually see uh, that information, I believe. But uh, otherwise, no. You just have your user would just have to report like what Michael talked about with it and say, "Hey, you know, this call keeps failing on me. Why? You know, sort of thing." Which is, I think, how you discovered the issue in three two when when you started enforcing the HTTP max uh, response time. You know, and that discussion about uh, happened to increase that to be at least the size of the ABI max utilization time for your get blocks calls to to to, to work. I remember when either the default changed or the flag got added, it really rippled because it was like 30 milliseconds or something that crazy low. That I just remember the, and that's why it's set all across. But I can also tell you, you know, yes, we run faster, nicer servers, you know, obviously for, for bigger chains, but you want to try to get by on something slower. Maybe it doesn't have to be speed demon. Yeah, the default. all of that stuff can can start timing out pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the default would work on a give block call across all of them on any hardware that's known to man currently. Uh, so you know, the, 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 some of those are rather expensive blocks to deserialize. The default, I yeah, I think you're right, thirty or whatever it is. What I'm trying to dig at, yeah, what I'm trying to dig at here is just to understand that uh, whether, like, for the sake of argument, let's just say that we did end up deciding, you know. As a community, that this this is this is better handled through um, you know history solutions, but that's coming in you know a couple versions or something. Again, sake of argument, right? Is this still worth doing now for for five if we're going in that direction? I guess what I'm getting at is you're asking a question for which you didn't provide us any instrumentation for us to give you that data. That's right. <laughs> I, I think it's the question. Right? Is it, if you want us to tell you how our nodes are operating, you need us to give us tools so we can measure how our nodes are operating and then we can give you that feedback. But yeah, I mean, if we're going to redesign something in a few versions, then, you know, is it worth doing an interim solution? I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, just, just for clarity, that's a, that's a hypothetical. I don't, I don't know. I, that. To, to re-clarify the question, I think, right, is, is there a need for this hybrid Kit block. It sounds like that's what we're owning. Yeah, no, that's a, I asked I'm, that question a few weeks ago in previous node operator table. Do we want that blocked at all? 
Right. Well, if if the end result is well, it's going to have to do its best case effort, and then eh, it'll throw out trash if it needs to. Yeah, and if it doesn't have the right API, it doesn't work either. Yeah. So you know, so it seems like there's a lot of conditions on this thing where it doesn't work. The the a the, the serialization and the timeouts and all of that, I think, isn't just constrained to the get blocks. Like I say, I mean that that's been all sorts of different, you know, whatever. So it's kind of a little separate issue. I would say if the targeted question is about this hybrid, uh, you know, halfway working get block, it does sound like maybe that's, maybe it is time to say, nah, if you want, here's the block, do your own work, or if you want to go get the old version of it, do your thing, or use a history solution that'll be happy to do it for you. Layer two, some kind of layer two solution. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a good summary there because yeah, the proposal is you know applies to Git table rows and and really it's Git table rows I think probably the most important one to discuss in in terms of this proposal and yeah we might talk about even Git table rows eventually only being in a, in a history solution but um, I think short term that's that's not going to be the case so I, I think our proposal still stands I mean yeah for the lock I think, think is is out of there but get table rows i do think that ability for it to snag a snapshot and say fine you want to rip for 30 minutes and get one result of the pristine static data because i mean i spend five minutes smashing a table to get eight nine million rows that's state changing <laughs> so uh i mean if that's included in this proposal that's two pieces and one thumbs up and one maybe not the get table running, but keep in mind that the shack is saying. Go ahead. I think the get block is useful for a lot of also keep in mind, you know, new developers coming into the space. And it's very easy to visualize for them, like to do a get block and actually see all that data simply for them without running ABIs and history solution. Uh, yeah. I get like, it. But not the question you rely on it in code, you know, like, like that halfway you know, word. You know, I mean, that's the concern is if the only way to truly get it working and not crippling, it, it's going to halfway return results. I mean, that's why I'm like, you're right. It, it's it's returning inaccurate, you know, ABI information and potentially throwing things out that, that might not be, you know, do. But if we look at the viewpoint from a developer, his like, or a new developer who is, you know, exploring, he is going to do get block generally on like modern blocks or like, you know, recent blocks that are more likely than not is going to get all the information he needs or somebody writing a smart contract and wants to check like how it affected the block and his, you know, code is obviously not going to run into an ABI serialization because, you know, I'm starting with simple code. I still see a value for it versus him being like, oh, get your old block and because he can't get the transaction, right? He can't get the transaction without a history solution. Uh, so I think there is still value for the proposal for get block, even if it yeah. cannot really be relied on programmatically. Said... So there's value, and then it will trip up that developer when he's like, get me the previous old block, and whoops, it has the wrong API, right? So, for, yeah, for that simple use case, it's valid. I agree. So well, then it... There might be a agenda item here, too, for the, for the Antelope developers call that Steven has started running just around like use cases for Git block for, for developers versus, um, you know, so I, I think there's, there are likely very valid use cases, but my naive, uh, assumption is that like 99% of what they're going to want to do is more get table rows type stuff, not, not block level stuff. Well, and I would wonder there, like if we shouldn't be, uh, encouraging developers to use the trace API plugin, um, or, you know, if, if, and if that doesn't have what they need, you know, maybe we'll need to enhance that so, so that it does, um, as kind of the, the way of pointing them to, you know, currently it, it doesn't do ABI serialization at all, unless you actually manually provide it the ABI. I was about to say, I think that's the problem is it's so clunky and manual and I mean, oops, another contract got added. And, oh, I got to go back and get it. I mean. Right. Oh, that would we, we, yeah, we certainly yeah, make more friendly. Yeah. We could certainly fix that, right? I mean, it wouldn't be a heavy lift to have it cached APIs at the point of time when they're created, so that it always has the correct APIs to use when serializing uh, any call, whether it be Git transaction or or, or Git block. You know, the the whole what one of the use cases for the trace API plugin. Um, well, 
kind of after the fact. But um, currently, in one's case for the Trace API plugin replacement for the V1 history um, plugin, right? Which kind of what developers used a lot because it was not, it was quickly not appropriate to be used on the main chain, right? Just because of the gigantic memory requirement for the thing, right? But developers, I think, continue to use it for, for long after it nominal use on, you know, in, on a chain, on a, on a live chain was, was anywhere near useful. And so the, you know, the trade tape API, I'm going to think in, in some regard tackles that, at least in terms of like all of our integration tests, that's what we replaced, you know, before all of our integration tests used the history of your ride. Now all of our integration tests use the uh, trace API plugin and it seems like we could, we could enhance that for developers. That's also one important fact I know I heard from a lot of, and exchanges were typically the ones, but anybody that's financial and really whatever, they really don't like having layer two solutions in vibe. Number one, obviously it's more complicated and clunky, but you have to trust somebody else's set of code is that when they lost yeah. that V1 native aspect and it was, well, you've got a period or diffuse or all, you know, all these other ones. You now have to trust the you know, Rio team or the, right. you know, substrate. And they would really didn't like, you know, you need to have in the native code base of the node, at least enough, maybe get raw block is enough where they can then retrieve their APIs and, or trace yeah. API whenever you statically. But the more we strip well, off no. those V cores and go beat the layer twos, the, yeah. there's a lot of people that don't consider those options. I think something that may be like just an idea for future is like an option to either, you know, retain, you know, the last X ABIs per contract or retain all ABIs for certain, uh, you know, whitelisted or whatever contracts that might fit a lot of these use cases because exchanges are typically monitoring only a few, you know, potential contracts, uh, like to satisfy this use case. And then they can just really have that contract save all this ABI in that layer one in node EOS, and then be able to either use trace API with the serialization of that, or, you know, get block would be guaranteed to be, uh, working for these contracts. Um, Couldn't that be like on the side queue that up trace API? I mean, if the trace API were a little better, it's great at individual contracts. It's the monstrosity of everything. That's really painful. So yeah, I, I think so, you know, the original. You know, originally it was developed for an exchange, right? That right. the whole point of why Trace API plugin was created. And and that's obvious in its design. Like, you know, it didn't need to cache ABIs because the only ABI that it that the, the targeted user cared about was ESIO token. And that hasn't changed since day one and you can easily just give it to it. And that's what it does. That's as a matter of fact, that's in the, the code example. It's like here, here's the one ABI that that you probably care about. And you can load it and it'll work. And so that's why, you know, and it's more efficient because it only looks at the one, right? So that's, that's why it was designed that way. And that's why it, that has that capability. But yeah, it could be optionally uh, enhanced to, to, to certainly do more than that. Uh, another option here, depending on people's use cases, which is available today for people is the new, uh, get transaction status that was added in, in V1 that actually does use the correct ABI in all cases. Uh, it uses the ABI that, that was uh, in effect when the transaction was executed and it gives you that transaction trace as it was, uh, as it is in, in block correctly. So that's another option for an individual transaction. It doesn't give it to you for full block, but it does give it to you correctly for a given transaction. So just a point of facilitation here. We, uh, it is 9.58 where I am, which means we've got two minutes left in the scheduled time. Um, so lots of good discussion, um, but what I do want to do now is sort of stop any uh, new points and try to synthesize and simplify, like, what are the takeaways from this discussion? So if anybody has kind of the uh, sort of bullet point level takeaways that we should track, throw them out for me. I guess the main things we talked about was the new proposal, which... Everybody who commented on, maybe they didn't like a certain part of it, but they definitely found value in other parts, like get table rows. I don't think anybody objects to the value it adds. And from my perspective, even get luck has that, uh, you know, additional value. My only thing would be that, uh, that thousand hard coded, uh, limit, uh, if you can kind of override it. And it seems you could, at least if you wanted unlimited with setting, you know, 
deserialization minus one that will also override the max row, which just should be documented. But I think like for me, that works for, for our use case. And of course, we're all thrilled about the HTTP, you know, like the public API threading. That was where we started things off with. Yeah, even a 4.0 git block is way faster. So. All right. Any other high level takeaways? Very good. Uh, I think that concludes our discussion. I'll hand it back to Daniel to close us out. Thank you. He fell asleep. Or is but I will. I I lost my new my new button was hiding. I'm back. Thank you guys. Um, so yeah, thank you, Brian. Thank you everyone for your feedback, and we'll uh, meet again next week. Good everyone. Take care, everyone. Cheers.